In this video, I want to talk about symmetry and how to formalize the effect of symmetry on physical and chemical properties of materials um, with the use of group theory. Symmetry is a very important concept in physics and chemistry. For example, if your system has inversion symmetry, such that when you change R by minus R, nothing in your interactions changes, then we know that the eigenstates of your Hamiltonian are either even or odd. Um, as a consequence, when you start with an even wave function, not necessarily an eigenstate, and let it time evolve, then it will always stay even. Parity is a conserved quantum number. We'll get back to this later in that lecture. And it's not only even and odd, that is a conserved quantity when you have inversion symmetry. This concept is much more general, known as the Noether theorem. Um, for example, when your system is translation invariant, momentum is conserved. Or if your system is time invariant, it doesn't matter if you do an experiment today or tomorrow, energy is a conserved quantity. Now, of course, these continuous symmetries you have in free space. Once you have a crystal or a molecule, you don't have continuous symmetry operations anymore in a crystal. It's a discrete translational symmetry, and therefore momentum is not a conserved quantum number, but crystal momentum is then the conserved quantum number. And in molecules and crystals as well, you have several rotations that leave your system invariant. Sometimes you have a translation plus rotation, translation plus mirror plane. So there are all kinds of symmetry operations. And by the Noether theorem, they must combine to then some conserved quantities in your system. So the questions that we want to answer and are able to answer with the use of group theory is for example, um, how can symmetry help us to solve the problem? So can we understand the different phases of matter? Um, which symmetry operations are there? And for that you really can use point group the theory to tell you um, how many symmetries and therefore how many different conserved quantities one has. Um, what are then these conserved quantities that relate to these symmetry operations? But also things like um, if I have a Hamiltonian and I want to find all eigenstates, how can I split my Hamiltonian in several blocks with the use of symmetry um, and then only solve smaller problems for each part of the problem related to a different symmetry? For example, again, if you have inversion symmetry, you can write down all even states and all odd states and you can solve the problems for the even states and the problem for the odd states separately. And that then also relates um, if you have a phase transition and some symmetry operations are removed from your Hamiltonian, how do state splits and with new eigenstates can I expect which states can interact, which cannot. And all these things you can answer with the use of group theory. Um, one last question that you can think of is, um, let's say I have a Hamiltonian that has cubic symmetry and now I have a potential in that Hamiltonian. What is the form of that potential? So if I have cubic symmetry, can my potential be equal to x? And this of course is very clearly not the case because in this case x, y and z are different. And the same is true for x squared. Also there the x, y and z direction are different. Here you don't have inversion symmetry, there you have inversion symmetry. Allowed um, potentials would be proportional to r square, x square plus y square plus z square, or for example to 5x to the fourth plus y to the fourth plus z to the fourth minus 3r to the fourth. Um, of course, if r square is okay, then r to the fourth could be subtracted here. Um, I like this one because this is a pure multipole, whereas the polynomial would not be. So these are allowed potentials in cubic symmetry. And with the use of group theory, one can actually immediately answer that question without too much algebra. Um, I will present you with a single video where we can, in the end, really answer these questions. Now, group theory is a very large field and you can easily um, make a complete lecture about group theory. Um, 
and all the insides and outs and formal notations. We will do that next semester. Um, here I just want to give you a brief overview that gives you all the essential concepts. We will do some derivations and at some point I will just then say, well, and this generalizes to the full case without further proof. Um, if you want the further proofs, then you will get them next semester. The first thing that we need to do is to define a few different concepts that we need to be able to talk about symmetry. And the first thing that you can think of are the symmetry operations. A symmetry operation is a coordinate transformation, including time, that leaves the Hamiltonian invariant. So for a system with inversion symmetry, it's r2 minus r, but you can have more uh, symmetry operations. You can have translations in free space, any translation in a crystal, a translation by one of the lattice factors, um, but you can have rotations. For example, if I have a molecule, a O4, where A and O are some atoms, A in the center, a planar molecule, makes it easy to draw, with angles that are 90 degrees, then a rotation by 90 degrees around the axis perpendicular to the plane would be a symmetry operation. So if we say this is X, Y, Z, then a rotation of 90 degrees around the z-axis is a symmetry operation. Let's call those operators S. Now let's have a look at the properties of such an operator. We know that this operator must leave the system invariant, so the Hamiltonian commutes with this operator. Hs minus Sh is zero. That means that eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, non-degenerate eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, are also eigenstates of the symmetry operation. So when H psi is E psi, and I talk about non-degenerate, We can uh, generalize this to the case of degenerate cases um, and I will prove this for the non-degenerate case and then we'll assume or show you how the degenerate case works. So for non-degenerate states, such that EI is not EJ for all Psi I not equal to Psi J, so we have a unique eigenenergy, we have that S Psi I is some phase e to the I theta times Phi I. So how can we prove this? When H Psi I is E I Psi I, it's an eigenstate, then S H Psi I is S E i psi i, and because s and h commute, we have s h psi i is e i s psi i. Now we use the fact that psi i is non-degenerate, and we see that psi i is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian with energy e i, but that s psi i is also an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian with energy e i, so if you have a non-degenerate system, then we know that S psi i is equal to psi i. Well, it's the same state and therefore the same ray, but not necessarily the same vector. So we are allowed to multiply it with the phase. which is exactly the proof that we wanted to show. 
So if you're looking for the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, you can look for the eigenstates of your symmetry operators. And you know that for the non-degenerate cases, these are the same. Now what happens when we have degeneracy? So with degeneracy, we can still label our wave functions, psi i, but now we have many of them, is e i psi i j, and j is an element of 1 to n, so we have an n-fold degenerate states, then the symmetry operator acting on the vector of all possible eigenstates is given by a unitary transformation of that vector. Psi i, psi i, 1 up to psi i, n. And u dagger u is equal to 1. So instead of finding the same state, you find a linear combination of all degenerate states. Now let's have a look how this works in real systems, or for an example, let's assume we have inversion symmetry. And we look at the eigenstates in an atom. Then we can, for example, have the wave function psi z, the pz wave function. And if you look at the angular distribution or the angular part of that wave function, then it is a cosine squared with one positive lobe and one negative lobe. And now the symmetry operation, the inversion acting on that wave function gives you r goes to minus r, so the plus lobe is mapped to the minus lobe and the minus lobe to the plus lobe, which is minus pz of r. And this is what we call an odd state. It changes sign under inversion symmetry. We can also look at the dz square orbital which has two positive lobe and a negative lobe. And if we invert that orbital, then the plus lobe is mapped to the plus lobe and the minus to the minus. So this is plus dz squared of r. And this is an even state. Now, if we think of states, then we can classify them according to the phase that they acquire under such symmetry operations. For inversion symmetry, that relates to even and odd states. Um, for translation symmetry, the phase that you pick up is the crystal momentum, e to the i k x. So if you translate by a vector x, the phase that you get is e to the i k times the translation vector. So that's the momentum that you have in there, or your wave vector. But for any other symmetry operation, rotations, we can define these kind of phases. And according to these phases, we can talk about even and odd states. And we have different labels for them instead of even and odd, A, B, E, G, etc., T. One of the important consequences of this phase that you get when you have a given symmetry operator is that two states can only interact with each other if they pick up the same phase under a symmetry operation. So let's formalize this. We are going to assume that we only have non-degenerate states. how to define this phase when you have degenerate states. We'll get back to later in this lecture, but I first want to give you some insight in what happens and how we can use symmetry. 
So let's assume that we only have non-degenerate states, such that you always pick up a face when you're an eigenstate of a symmetry operator, such that S psi 1 is e to the i theta 1, psi 1, and S psi 2 is e to the i theta 2, psi 2. Now the statement is that psi 1 h psi 2 is either 0 when theta 1 is different from theta 2 or some value when theta 1 is theta 2. And this value can still be 0, but it can also be any other value. So you can only say if they are different, then it has to be 0. If they are the same, then it can be any value that we want or that happens. So in order to prove this, we can have a look at the commutator of the Hamiltonian with the symmetry operator. And for this, we have a look at hs minus sh. And this has to be zero. We now let our symmetry operator act on S2 or on S1. And what you find is that you have e to the i theta 2 minus e to the i theta 1 acting on psi 1 h psi 2 has to be zero. This is true when theta 1 is equal to theta 2 or when the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is zero. And that's exactly the case that we wanted to prove. And for degenerate cases and how to define this, we'll get back to later. Now let's see um, what kind of symmetry operations one can have. And for that we have to define the symmetry operations. And I want to look at the nomenclature of symmetry operations. First of all, we have a very important symmetry operation, and that is the identity operation. We want to be able to define an algebra and a group, and for that the operator that does nothing must be an element of your group. So that's the first symmetry operation we're going to define. Then we can have rotations, which is an n-fold rotation. Ah. And I'm going to restrict myself here to point groups. So symmetry operations around one point in space. We have an n-fold rotation, which we will call Cn. So, for example, C2 is a rotation by 180 degrees. And a C4 is a rotation by 90 degrees. So, an n-fold rotation is a rotation by 2 pi over n, or 360 divided by n degrees. Now, of course, um, it matters around which axis you rotate. And for that, we're going to say if we have several of such rotations that are symmetry operations, we're going to look at the direction of Cn for the largest n. And this is what we will call the principal axis. Then we can define a mirror plane, defined by sigma.
And now you can have different types of mirror planes. We will define sigma h, sigma v, and sigma d, depending on how this mirror plane lies with respect to other symmetry operations that we have. Sigma h is perpendicular to the principal axis. Sigma v includes the principal axis. And sigma d includes the principal axis. And bisects two C2 rotations. So if I have two rotations at some angle of C2 and I have a mirror plane in between, then that is a sigma d. If um, you don't have these C2 axes, it's a sigma v. Um, so in principle, I should add here, includes the principal axis and is not a sigma d for the division of sigma v. Then we have an inversion, which I will call i. And we have an improper rotation, Sn. And Sn is a rotation plus a mirror plane. And an Sn can be made out of a sigma h, where now the principal axis is the axis on which you rotate, times Cn. So an S6 would be a six-fold rotation plus a mirror perpendicular to that rotation. Now with these operators we can define a group and I will focus here on point groups. If you add translation to it, you can make space groups as well. And a group or a point group is a closed set of symmetry operations. So you pick a certain number of these symmetry operations, but not any set is a group. You have to fulfill a few conditions. So if O1 and O2 are element of the group, let's call the group P, then O3 is O1 times O2 must also be element P. Furthermore, we require that E is element P and we require that if O1 is element P, then O2 must be element P for which O2, O1 is the identity operator, is E. So if O1 is an element of the group, then the inverse operator must be an element of the group as well. So if you're allowed to rotate by 90 degrees to the right around a certain axis, then you must be allowed to rotate by minus 90 degrees. So in terms of symmetry, that makes a lot of sense. Um, if I have two symmetry operations that leave your system invariant, then also the product of these two must leave your system invariant. If I have a state and I can rotate to the right and that leaves your system invariant, then you must be allowed to rotate back to the left, such that your system stays invariant. And doing nothing for sure will leave your system invariant. There are infinitely many different point groups that you can make. 
Um, you can think, for example, at the point group where you have a rotation around a certain axis and a C1, a C2, a C3, etc. You can make as high as you want. There are 32 point groups. which you can use to make a lattice. Um, you don't have tiling of pentagons, so only certain rotations allow you to make a tiling in two and three dimensions. Um, and there are 32 of them. And these 32 point groups are listed and labeled. And one place where you can find them, for example, is quanti.org and then physics underscore chemistry and then point groups. If you go here and just click on the menu items, you will get there as well. Now let's have a look at an example. And as an example, I will use the group D4. So these different groups have names, and if you just click on the name, then you will find what the symmetry operations are that belong to this group. It's just a name, you could have equally called them uh, Mr. Smith group or any other name you like. So we for sure know that E is an element of D4. Now let's have a look at the other rotations. So if I have here my coordinate system, x, y, and z, then the four relates to a principal axis of fourfold rotational symmetry. So what this group is, is the group of the rotation of a square. And when we have a square, we have of course, a C4 rotation, but that also means we have a C4 square. And you are allowed to rotate twice by 90 degrees, which is a C2, either because you see that it's a symmetry of the group, or you know that the product of any two symmetry operations must be a symmetry operations. And we have C4 cubed. You are allowed to rotate three times by 90 degrees. C4 to the fourth is back to the identity operation. Then we have around the x and the y axis a C2, which we will call C2 prime because it's not aligned with the principal axis. And around the x plus y and x minus y directions, we also have a C2. And let's call those double prime. Now the D4 group doesn't have mirror planes or inversion, so you have to put on the edges something that breaks inversion symmetry. So our C4 is parallel to Z, C2 prime is parallel to X or Y, and C2 double prime is parallel to X minus Y or X plus Y. While we are Labeling them exactly in this way will become clear later when we group the different symmetry operations in classes. Now we can talk about the order of our group. And the aim is to well, be able to tell, hey, how many symmetry operations do I have? Is this exhaustive or not? Should I be able to find other symmetry operations in my system or not? And that is, of course, uh, well, then important if you want to know how much conserved quantities you have in your system. The order of the group. is given by the number of symmetry operations. Of that group. 
So the order for d4 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. We have eight symmetry operations. Besides the order of a group, just counting the number of symmetry operations that we have, we can also have a look at the different classes for the symmetry operations. Some symmetry operations are more equivalent to each other than others. And for that we divide our symmetry operations into different classes. So two operators, two symmetry operators that belong to our group, O1 and O2 belong to the same class. If there is another symmetry operation T, such that T minus 1 O1 T is equal to O2. And then of course, if you multiply from the left with T, from the right with T minus 1, you will find that T O2 T minus 1 is O1. So whenever you're able to find a symmetry operation, which you can use as a unitary transformation to change one symmetry operation into the other, we will tell, we will call these two operators to belong to the same class. So let's have a look at an example. And for that we're going to take our D4 point group. And there we have the C2 around the X and the C2 around the Y belong to the same class. Here, so what we called here C2 prime, which is a C2 either around the x or the y direction, belong to the same class. And if you take a C4 cubed, C2x, C4, then this is equal to C2 around the y direction. So these belong to the same class. The same we can do for our x plus y and x minus y belong to the same class. And for that you have that uh, again, so this we call the double prime, c4 cubed, c2 x plus y, c4 is c2 x minus y. And then we have one more, where two operators belong to the same class. And that is C4 and C4 cubed belong to the same class. Because if we look at a C2 prime, C4, C2 prime, C2 prime is its own inverse, then this is a C4 cubed. So again, we have a class here. Now, if two operators belong to the same class, then a wave function picks up the same phase if rotated by either of them. So if I have a wave function that is a non-degenerate eigenstate of one of the symmetry operations, then all symmetry operations which belong to the same class will give you the same phase for that wave function. So O1 and O2 belong to the same class. And I know O1 psi is e to the i theta psi 
then O2 psi is e to the i theta psi for non-degenerate states psi. So there are no other wave functions psi that pick up the same phase. We can make a proof. Given that O1 is T minus 1 O to T and T psi is E to the I phi psi then O2 psi is E to the I alpha psi ah, so these are the givens our wave function we can transform O1 from O2 and the wave function is an eigenstate of two symmetry operations. And we want to show that O1 psi is e to the i alpha psi. So O1 must pick up the same phase as O2. So if we look at t minus 1, O2 t psi, then this is t minus 1, O2, e to the i phi psi, because that's the phase that you pick up with t. Then this is equal to t minus 1, O2 acting on that wave function, e to the i alpha, e to the i phi psi. And this is the inverse of that operator, so that picks up the inverse phase, and we're back to e to the i alpha psi and that is exactly what we wanted to show because this is equal to O1 psi is equal to the same phase times that wave function. So two states that or two operators that belong to the same class give you the same phase for non-degenerate eigenstates. With that we can have a look at representations. We have discussed before the symmetry operations that we have. Now let's have a look at our states and how to represent these states. So what we have did before is define an algebra which H operators and H is the order of the group. For this algebra, you know that operators can be multiplied for some set of symmetry operations. I, J, and K. So in D4, we know that C2x times C2 x plus y is a C4 around the z. C4z, C4z is given by C2z. C4 cubed, C4 around C2 around z is equal to C4, Z, for example. So we have all these different symmetry operations and a rules how to multiply them. We can now try to find explicit matrices that fulfill these multiplication rules. Different operators, different elements give you different other elements, but there are explicit statements on this element times that element gives you that element. 
So let's see if we can find matrices for which these rules are fulfilled. So we can, very simple, find one matrix, which would be a matrix of dimension one. would fulfill all these relations. Yeah, one times one is one, so one is definitely a representation that fulfills all these relations. It's also a very trivial representation that doesn't give you much information yet. Now we can look at an example for the different representations that we have. And for that we'll have a look at D4 symmetry. And in D4 symmetry we have eight symmetry operations, E, the C4 around the Z, the C4 around the Z squared, the C4 around the Z cubed, then we have a C2 around X and C2 around y and c2 around x plus y and a c2 around x minus y. And the first representation that we discussed would be a matrix of dimension 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And indeed, if you multiply 1 with 1, it's 1 such that all multiplication rules that have to be fulfilled for our group are definitely fulfilled. Now we can also take another representation, if we take a one-dimensional representation where we still have a one for the first four symmetry operations, but a minus one for the last four symmetry operations, then also the algebra of our group is fulfilled. The product of one of the first two symmetry operations, or one of the first four symmetry operations, gives you a symmetry operation that's one of the first four, the product of the two of the last four symmetry operations gives you one of the first four symmetry operations. And the product of one of the first four times one of the last four symmetry operations gives you one of the last four symmetry operations. So it's that indeed 1, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 is a valid representation of the algebra that we have to fulfill for the D4 group. Now, when 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 is a valid representation of a one dimensional, uh, is a valid one dimensional representation, we can of course also make a two dimensional representation where we just take the identity matrix of dimension 2. And also those matrices fulfill the algebra that we need to fulfill for the product of two symmetry operations. Now this is a rather trivial two-dimensional representation and you can then of course easily make a three or a four-dimensional representation. But we can also make a less trivial two-dimensional representation. If I take one one for the identity operator, one zero, minus one zero for C4, then minus one minus one for C4 squared, zero minus one, one zero for C4 cubed, and then we have zero one one zero for the C2 around the X, zero minus one minus one zero for C2 around Y, one minus one zero zero for the X plus Y, and minus one plus one for the C2 around X minus Y. Also those matrices fulfill the algebra that we need. We can easily check this for a few of the elements. C4Z times C4Z must be C4Z squared. So if we now look at our matrices, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. 0, 1, minus 1, 0 is row times column is minus one, row times column is zero, row times column is zero, bottom row times last column is minus one. And indeed we see that our product is fulfilled here and a C2 times a C4 squared, uh, C4 times a C2 squared gives you then the C2 cubed. 
and for all other products of these matrices, you see that you fulfill the algebra that we need to fulfill. So this is a valid two-dimensional representation of the symmetry operations in the D4 point group. Now we've seen that you can make up an infinite many number of representations. And some are trivial and some are much less trivial. This one you can easily dream up once you know that this is a representation. This one is much harder to dream up. So with that we can have a look at the irreducible representations, which are those that are hard to dream up. So an n-dimensional representation representation is reducible if there exists a linear transformation such that all matrices are block diagonal. Block diagonal means that you have some values, you have zeros, and you have some values again. If all matrices have this form, then you can reduce your representation into the top block and the lower block. And that is definitely the case for the representation that we have here. You see that the identity matrix is block diagonal. It is diagonal even. So this falls apart in two representations of dimension one instead of one representation of dimension two. So if this is not possible, So there is no transformation that makes your matrices block diagonal, then it's an irreducible representation. For the D4 point group, you see the different irreducible representations here, and we have given them names and well, they are not really fancy names, A, B, T, E are kind of names that we use. And then we put in different indices, one or two. Um, very often the A and B representations are one dimensional representation, the E representation is a two dimensional representation, a T representation is a three dimensional and a G would be four dimensional. When you have inversion symmetry, our D4 point group doesn't, then we put in an index, gerade für even, ungerade für odd representations. But that's the kind of name that we use. Now, instead of using the names A, B, E, T, we can also just label them in order gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, gamma 4. So gamma index i is also a name that you can use for the different representations. Now the following statement I will make without proof. And two irreducible representations are element-wise orthogonal. So if I have a representation, comma i, 
and I have a representation, comma j, then they are zero. And this is for the case when the dimension of comma i is one for each of the elements of comma i is one. Now, if you have a matrix with larger dimension, then this helps element-wise. So in that case, comma i dot comma j index i j is zero. So for our d four point group, it is the element each of the elements of your uh, representation of your matrix representation defines an orthogonal vector to the other. We can easily test this, for example, in D4H or in D4. We have the gamma 1 is given by 8 ones, gamma 2 is 1, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, and the product of the two is 0. If you look at comma 5, then we have four matrices, either the top of each of them, or the right element, or the left bottom, or the right bottom, and no of them are orthogonal matrices. Now from the completeness theory, we know that the irreducible representations form a set and therefore we know that the order of the matrixes is, is the sum over all irreducible representations times the dimension of that representation squared. A vector of length h has h independent orthonormal vectors and the number of orthonormal vectors is given by the dimension of each IREP square for each IREP and then sum over all IREPs gives you then the number of possible irreducible representations that we have. So that's of course an important statement if you want to know how many different states and how many different phases you can have under a certain symmetry operation or under a certain set of symmetry operations that form a group. Now, we don't have to actually build the representations of our symmetry operations. Um, as they are invariant under unitary transformations, we can look at the character instead of the full representation. And for that we define the character that we have. So if we have a representation, then any unitary transformation of this representation yields a good representation. So let's have a look at the proof. So given that O1 is O2 times O3 for some matrix, then what we want to show is that U O1 U minus 1 is U O2 O minus 1 U O3 u minus 1. So we have a representation for which this holds. We now make a unitary transformation of all our matrices u01, u minus 1, and this then stood still gives you the same relations. And indeed, here you find u minus 1 u, so this is u, o2, o3, u minus 1, and o2 times o3 is o1, so this is definitely the same. <coughs> So indeed, any unitary transformation of your representation 
yields a valid representation. That also means that um, your representation is basically invariant under all these possible uh, unitary transformations and only values that are invariant under unitary transformations actually have physical meaning and the value that has this is actually the trace of the matrix. So only the trace of the representation has a meaning. And this trace is called the character. So I have a vector of all representations. I take the trace of the each, I take the trace of each element of that vector, and that gives me the character, chi. This trace of, or the character of two operators that belong to the same class are equivalent. show that because the trace of a matrix is the trace of a unitary transformation and therefore the trace of O1 must be the trace of T minus 1 O2 T is the trace of O2. Now there is another important statement that we can make, and that is the character of a reducible representation. Is equal to the character of the sum of all irreducible representations this reproducible representation is made of. trace of O1 plus the trace of O2 is equal to the trace of O1, O2 is equal to the trace of some unitary transformation O1, O2 times U dagger or U minus 1. So if I have some general representation that can be transformed such that it is block diagonal, then the trace of these blocks is the trace of each block separately, or the trace of the full matrix is the trace of each block separately, So it's that the trace of a reducible representation is the sum of the trace of the irreducible representations. Now just as our representations form orthogonal vectors, our characters form orthogonal vectors. For the irreducible representations. your group and then a sum over all
elements in your character is delta ij for two different representations i, with h the order of the group. There's one important statement to make here. I and J must belong to a different class. For the delta function. So this is one if I and J relate to the character of two operators in the same class and different when they are different classes. Well, with that we can immediately conclude that there are as many different classes of symmetry operations in a point group as there are different irreducible representations. For the very simple reason that we have orthonormal vectors and completeness. So in D4 we have five classes E, C4 around the Z, and there are two of them C4 and C4 cubed, then the C2 around the Z are C2 prime and our C2 double prime. And I put the number of symmetry operations that we have in front of them. Then we have our irreducible representations and the character for the A1 representation or the gamma one. We have all ones, then we have our one, 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 minus one, minus one for the a2 or gamma 2, and these are just names. We have 1, minus 1, 1, 1, minus 1 for B2, uh, B1, gamma 3. We have 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1 for B2 or gamma 4, and then we have an two-dimensional irreducible representation gamma 5 which is explicitly given by the matrices that I gave before but if you take the trace of those matrices you find 2 0 minus 2 0 0 and these is, are the characters of the representations that we have these are the irreducible representations. And these are the symmetry operations. Ordered by class. If you now take a vector like this, so this would be the comma E, and you take another vector, This would be comma A2. Then you find that comma I dot comma J is equal to zero when I is not equal to J or is equal to the order of the group when I is equal to J. And with that, you can, if you have an arbitrary state, basically have a look at the character of how that state behaves under the different symmetry operations and then see it, how it is built up from the different irreducible representation. If you compare this to an even and an odd state, of course, then you would have inversion symmetry, which is not an element. Then even states have character one and odd states have character minus one. So this is a generalization of the concept even and odd 
even and odd would be the names of the irreducible representation, plus and minus one would be the character under the symmetry operation inversion. Um, but here you have then of course many more. So if you only have inversion, plus the identity, otherwise it wouldn't be a group. Then we had E and I, and then we have the even or gerade and the ungerade. The gerade would be one, one, and the ungerade would be one, minus one. So that would be CI point group, where you just have inversion symmetry. We can now also make a statement that if I write my basis in the term of wave functions that belong to a certain irreducible representation, then my Hamiltonian is block diagonal. I will find five different blocks, one block belonging to the A1, one block belonging to the A2, one block belonging to the B1, one block belonging to the B2, one belonging to the E. Just as when I have inversion symmetry and I write my basis in even and odd states, I will find that my Hamiltonian is block diagonal with only even states interacting with even states and odd states interacting with odd states. And that is independent on how difficult or extended your Hamiltonian can be. So by just writing down the basis in terms of symmetrized wave functions, which is much easier to solve than solving a many body problem, um, you already break down your system and have smaller problems to solve. So while instead of one big problem in the force symmetry, you have four, four smaller problems to solve. Now let's have a look how these representations relate to wave functions. Now let's talk about wave functions with a given angular momenta. We just think about point groups, so we talk about wave functions expanded around a center. So I'm going to look at the wave function psi r that is given as a wave function that depends on a radius and some part that depends on theta and phi. We have an angular momenta j in our system when we are spherically symmetric. And then we have 2j plus 1 states with jz going from minus j up to j. Of course, we do not necessarily have to quantize in the z direction. You can also think of jx going from minus j to j. But there are 2j plus 1 states for each value of j. So if you now think about rotations, then for each j you have a matrix of 2j plus 1 by 2j plus 1 that tells you how a state with a given day jz is transformed into another state of jz. So within a basis of a state with a good angular momentum j, all our symmetry operations are given by matrices of 2j plus 1 by 2j plus 1. So as an example, we can have a look at the p-orbital. For a p-orbital, we have L is J is 1, we neglect the spin, and our basis is Px, Py, Pz for the 2j plus 1 states. Of course, we can also think in terms of complex spherical harmonics, P minus 1, P0, P1, which are linear combinations of Px and Py for the P plus minus 1, but it's often easier to stay with real wave functions. If we now want to look at explicit representations for our symmetry operations on this basis, then E leaves the Px to the Px, the Py to the Py, and the Pz to the Pz. And C4 around the Z would be a rotation where X goes to Y, Z stays at Z. So on a basis of 
px, py, pz. We have that the pz orbital is just rotating around this axis. So that stays a pz orbital. The px orbital becomes a py orbital and the py orbital becomes a minus px orbital. So this would be the matrix representing a C4 rotation. And then of course we can think of the other rotations as well. And if we look at our D4 point group as an example, then we again, we have eight symmetry operations, the identity operator, the C4 operator, zero, one, uh, that we had before, then we have C4 squared, minus one, minus one, zero, C4 cubed, zero, one, minus one. Then we have the C2 around X, one, minus one, minus one, we have C2 around Y, minus one, one, minus one, we have the C2 around X plus Y, zero, one, one, zero, one, and we have the C2 around X minus Y, zero, minus one, minus one, zero, one. So eight matrices of three by three that represent your rotation on a basis of Px, Py, and Pz. Now these matrices are block diagonal and they fall apart in a Px and Py and a Pz. So we don't even have to search on how to block diagonalize it. We immediately see that these matrices are block diagonal. So in terms of representations, we find that the Pz is a representation or an irreducible representation and the px and the py without showing here you are not able to find a unitary transformation that would block diagonalize all these two by two matrices simultaneously so the px and the py together also form an irreducible representation well there is only one two-dimensional representation which is gamma five or E. And the PZ orbital has one, one, one with minus ones on the other. And therefore this belongs to the A2 representation or gamma two. So if you have a P orbital in a D4 point group, Then we immediately can write down the eigenstates. So in spherical symmetry, they are degenerate. In D4, we have the Pz orbital and the Px and the Py orbital degenerate. Now, of course, I cannot tell you which one is higher based on point group symmetry. So we could also have Px py down and pz up. But we do know that you have a splitting, we just can't tell you how big that splitting is. Now for a general shell with angular momentum L, We can write our wave functions, Psi and Lm, as some radial wave function times the spherical harmonics. We 
which is your radial wave function times a polynomial in cosine theta times e to the i m phi divided by square root of 2 pi. So if you think of a rotation around the z-axis, where this is your polar angle phi, then a rotation around the z-axis will give you a phase of e to the i m times the angle with which you rotate. So if I rotate alpha around z, then my rotation matrix is given by e to the minus i l alpha e to the minus i l minus 1 alpha up to e to the i l alpha for a state with angular momentum l. So in order to find explicit matrix representations for a rotation around the z direction is always easy. Now, if you want to rotate around another coordinate, you can always first quantize in that direction. Then it's easy to find that rotation matrix. And then we can use that um, rotation matrix are independent of the choice of orientation. In the end, you only want the character, which is the trace of your rotation matrix. So you just check the trace when you quantize in the direction where you rotate. And you know that the rotation then, or the trace, that character, is valid for any direction you would have quantized. So with that we can easily calculate the characters of the systems that we have. We then get matrices. You can then decompose them into the different irreducible matrices that we have. And then you know how your state split in different symmetries. So the character of a CN operation for a state with angular momentum L is the sum m is minus l to l e to the i m alpha and alpha is 2 pi divided by n which is equal to the sine l plus a half alpha divided by sine alpha over 2. Now, if we look at the p-orbital in the four-point group, we can find that the character of the p-shell, we have our classes of symmetry operations, C4z, C2z, C2 prime, C2 double prime, around x and y or x plus y x plus y, x plus minus y, e is 3, 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. If you now want to find the irreducible representations, then you can use that chi p is the sum over i and i times the character of your irreducible representations. And we furthermore know that's 1 over the dimension of your uh, group is given by chi, chi i, chi j is delta i j, such that we have n i is equal to 1 over order times chi i dot chi p. So we take this vector, we can take the dot product with the character of each of the irreducible representations, and then we know 
if that is included or not. And for this we find again that the P shell has an E and an A2 representation. So with this you can do a decomposition of the state into its irreducible representations. And you know how different shells will split when you include an additional perturbation of a certain symmetry. Now these character tables can be found in many different textbooks. You will also find them uh, in the web on different sites. The website on Quanti that I showed you before has a list of all these character tables. Um, there are different labels that we use for our irreducible representations. Um, as I already stated before, A1, A2, B1, B2 for single fold states E for two-fold degenerate, T for three-fold, G for four-fold, an U for ungerade, a G for gerade, even an odd for point groups with inversion symmetry. Um, just like momentum is conserved when you have translation symmetry, each of these irreducible representations comes with a conserved quantity, um, angular momenta or well, the phase that you pick up under the symmetry operations that you have in your point group, which is the same as the phase that you pick up under a translation for momenta, where you pick up the phase into the ik times the translation that you do. But now of course for the different symmetries that we have in our discrete groups. One very important group is the cubic point group. Many crystals that we have have cubic symmetry, which is the OH point group, where we have a central atom surrounded by four atoms or, um, or six atoms if you have a central atom. And in this point group there are 48 symmetry operations. And they form 10 classes. So we immediately know that we need to be able to find 10 possible irreducible representations. And these irreducible representations are the A1G, A2G, EG, T1G, and T2G. And we have inversion symmetry, so we also have A1U, A2U, EU, T1U, and T2U. And again, these are one-fold. These dimensions are one, this dimension is two, and the dimension of the T is three. And what you can do now is have a look on how the different shells will split in these point groups. And what you find is that the S shell, which is spherical, so under all rotations, it basically picks up a phase of one. So this is the trivial representation, one, 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 for all your 48 symmetry operations. So that is the A1G irreducible representation. P becomes a T1U irreducible representation such that we know that the P shell in cubic symmetry doesn't split. Then we have D, and D transforms like T2G and EG. We have F, which goes to A2U, T1U, and T2U and G, which goes to A1G, EG, T1G, T2G. And you see now that we need to go to G for F the first time, an A1G again, such that when you have a cubic crystal with an S orbital, then locally it will not mix with P, D or F electrons, 
but it will only mix with angular momentum g, which of course is very high, such that in cubic symmetry, for example, when we discussed uh, the alkali metals, um, you really say we have an s orbital and a p orbital. Well, then of course you should say, well, in cubic symmetry, angular momenta is not conserved anymore, but this S electron cannot mix with additional D orbitals. It has to mix with an additional G electron. Well, and close to the nucleus, the G angular momenta has very high energy. So it's said that mixing is actually quite small. And the eigenstates are, although not perfect, pretty close to states that have perfect angular momenta. your D shell immediately branches to two states. So if we look at our D orbital in cubic symmetry, then we get EG. And T to G orbitals, the EG orbitals are X squared minus Y squared and Z squared, whereas the T to G are X, Y, X, Z. And Y, Z, when we have um, cubic C4 axis along the X, Y, and Z direction. We have seen um, before that if you think of the type of bonding, then in such a symmetry, the E, D, G orbitals make sigma bonds, where, for example, we have a D shell and then P orbitals, then the E, G orbitals are pointing towards the ligands and your T to G orbitals make pi bonds when you have an OH point group. So now we have seen that with the use of symmetry and point groups, we can determine how our states will split when we have an additional potential of a certain symmetry. When our crystal is of a certain point group, then states will split. And symmetry allows you to immediately tell what the possible eigenstates are. We don't know about the eigenenergies, but we at least know how many states, how many different bands you should expect in your molecule or crystal. Now, besides the question on how many states you have, you can also answer the question on how your potential should look like. Which terms in your potential are allowed and which ones are not. So if I have a potential, then V of R, and I have some symmetry, it's not be allowed to have any form, but it must have a specific form. So in cubic symmetry, you can't have terms that are proportional to X or Y, because they definitely would break the cubic symmetry. Now in order to know how we can write our potential, we can expand the potential on terms of spherical harmonics. So we're going to write our potential as a sum over our spherical harmonics, theta phi. And of course, AKM is allowed to be radial dependent. Now for a potential, we know that if you apply a symmetry operation on that potential, that potential should come back to itself. So we know that OI times V of R has to be V of R for all OI in the symmetry group. Well, with that, we see that a valid representation for OI would just be one such that V of R must be an A1G representation of the group. So 
So if you look back at cubic symmetry, then we can have a potential that is spherical. You cannot have an angular momentum 1, 2, or 3, but you can have an angular momentum 4 in your potential again. So in cubic symmetry, the expansion coefficients k are only non-zero for k is 0 or k is 4. And then of course we can ask what m's do we have when k is equal to 4. And of course even higher angular momenta are allowed to be in there. Now, in order to solve this, you have the equation that a symmetry operation acting on your potential needs to be equal to the potential for any radial part. And for that you can again write down your potential in terms of spherical harmonics and see which terms of these spherical harmonics belong to the A1G representation and then find the explicit function for that. And in cubic symmetry, you will find that VOH as a function of theta and phi is given by a spherical harmonics with L and M is equal to zero plus some form factor times the spherical harmonics with L equal four and then a linear combination of m is 0, m is minus 4, and m is plus 4. And of course, higher angular momenta are still possible. Now, if you think of coupling between 2d electrons, then only Angular momenta 4 can couple 2d electrons. Angular momentum 6 would never couple 2d electrons with each other, such that you can actually stop your expansion because higher angular momenta are not important. So not only can symmetry help you to tell you what the possible eigenstates are, it also helps you to write your potentials in terms of expansions of spherical harmonics and only a few of those expansion terms are important. So we've seen that um, symmetry can help you a lot to reduce your problem. Um, symmetry leaves, leads to a conservation of um, the state when it is an irreducible representation. It will always stay a state of that same irreducible representation an even state when the time evolves will always stay even, a state that belongs to an A1G will always be a state that belongs to an A1G, or more general, a state that belongs to irreducible gamma i will always be a state that belongs to the irreducible representation gamma i. Independent if this refers to momenta, the parity of the state, or how your state behaves under a certain set of symmetry operations in your point group or your space group. Um, I realized this was a very short introduction through point group symmetry. Um, nonetheless, I hope to have shown you a bit of the ideas that are in there, where these namings come from. Uh, when we talk about an irreducible representation or say, hey, this state belongs to the T1G or the EG irreducible representation, that we basically mean the same thing as, hey, this state is even or odd but now not just for inversion symmetry, but for all possible symmetry operations that we have. And as said, um, next semester we'll have a set of lectures where we do the full derivation and have more time for each of all the concepts that we introduced here. For now, thank you very much for your attention. Stay healthy. We see each other later. <laughs>